Can you explain that J-shaped pipe you are holding there? And we are also expecting company. Welcome to the Rockingham Meeting House. It's a foggy morning here in Vermont. Charles was down here shoveling sand at the water tanks before I even finished breakfast. We are burying the connecting water lines between the tanks and then we're going to bury the tanks themselves. Kind of difficult to see the progress on film so I just wanted to show you what's happening on the edges of the tank here. Right here on the outside edge you can see that it's been built up. We've got a long way to go but we're building right up to the red sharpie mark on the edges of these containers. We're going to put insulation around the whole thing, like a box, as soon as we get it built up and flattened around the edges to that red Sharpie marker. You might remember seeing some pipes coming out the bottom of these and the holes that we drilled toward the bottom. So you can see that those are completely covered up. And then in between, you can see a little bit of exposed white there, but we're covering up the pipes in between the tanks here as well. And then once it's nice and good and covered, it will be tamped down. And then eventually the sand will come up all the way to the tops. and over the tops eventually and on either side of the insulation box which you'll see in a future video. Are you going tank diving? Well, not really water in there right now so it's kind of hard to dive. Can you explain that J-shaped pipe you are holding there? It's the water entry. Water will come, rainwater will come into the tank and down the pipe and through the J and it channels the water back up. It's called a calming entry. So you're not pushing water down at the bottom and stirring up all the dust and everything that settles to the bottom. What are you doing now, dog? <laughs> so you saw the the J water entry 
And now we've got a P-trap water exit. So the water will actually flow over this standpipe and down and out the exit when it's full. And the P-trap puts a water level in there to keep critters from coming back in the drain and up into the tank. It makes a water barrier. Good morning. We are expecting the skies to open up any minute now with a pretty big downpour that will fill our water tank. And we are also expecting company. My Aunt Sharon and Uncle John have come all the way from Washington in their own RV. And they've been traveling for months now and they'll be staying for about a week on our property. So you'll get to meet them shortly. In fact, since many of our subscribers are interested in fiberglass campers, you will also have a chance to get to know their fifth wheel trailer in an upcoming episode. Aunt Pam and Uncle Bob also joined us from Connecticut. We played six-handed pinochle, visited our local swimming hole, and did some sightseeing. We checked out the oldest meeting house in Vermont that is preserved in its original form, and it was so interesting that we wanted to share it with you. Welcome to the Rockingham Meeting House, a place where the, the town is always owned. Started building it in 1787, finished it in 1800. Had worship services here for the Union Meeting House. Uh, the Congregationalist, Methodist, and Baptist met here every Sunday. Bible studies probably during the week. The town also used it as a meeting house for town hall meetings and uh, for the select board meetings. Very active until about 1840. Afterwards, uh, the faith communities moved down to uh, Bellows Falls and built churches down there. It became simply the town hall until it was abandoned in 1869 until a bunch of citizens in 1906 said, stop, we're rotting back into the ground. We need to bring it back. It's part of our history. So a bunch of citizens got together, passed the hat, spent two years doing a light restoration, bringing the place back to the memory, the community understanding of what their, their city upon a hill was. Meanwhile, the young vireos in our backyard grew up very fast. After they opened their eyes, I put out my camera one more time, and by the next day, they had both left the nest. We looked at the weather forecast for the infamously windy Mount Washington in New Hampshire and chose a promising day for an outing to the Cog Railway that takes visitors to the summit. The cog is named for the gear-shaped pinion in the middle of the train, which grips the ratchet between the rails to move it forward up the mountain and slow it down on the return trip. Both the locomotive and the passenger car are equipped with cogs, along with a separate set of brakes and a person to control them. We took this train up to the summit, where we found a visitor center with a small museum featuring the famous observatory built to keep an eye on the world's worst weather. Are you hiding from the wind? Yep. <laughs> there was a pretty basic snack shop and a surprising number of people. There were other railway riders, and hikers, and visitors who had climbed the road by car. We descended the mountain in this train, and we can recommend choosing seats with the down mountain view if you enjoy an expansive but slightly terrifying view from your window. My camera doesn't do it justice because I would have to hang it out the window to show the steepness of the drop-off. One of the coolest things we learned today is that the Appalachian Trail crosses the Cog Railway quite close to the summit of Mount Washington. We also learned there are rock cairns on the trail at frequent intervals to help hikers stay on the path in thick fog. Mm -hmm. 
and while most of the trains run a 20% biodiesel mix, there are two genuine steam engines in the fleet for those looking for an even more historical experience. The guys got up early this morning and moved the rest of the sand. Remember that big pile? It's no longer here. Of course, we're going to need a lot more sand to go all the way over the level of the cisterns. In fact, you can see how high over the cisterns the ground level will be right at the top of that black riser, which is um, for access to each of the manhole covers in the cisterns. So I came out here to the place where we we're going to build our yurt and I found Charles and Uncle John laying out the positions of the piers that will be underneath the yurt platform. The yurt itself is still right here, waiting to be unpacked. <laughs> I understand why Charles is always wearing his bug hat. Just trying to measure for piers. You have a hole. I got another hole over there. Two more there. In total, there will be 25 piers to support the yurt platform itself, and 22 more to support the deck that will wrap around it. We're glad you could join us on our day trips this week, and we look forward to sharing the yurt build with you, along with the completion of the water catchment system.